Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, we already have 24 attendees. Uh, we are expecting uh, a bit more than 60. And nevertheless, um, we start with the welcoming words. Um, thank you very much for attending at this early hour. I suppose most of you are in the CET time zone. So uh, welcome to our webcast series um, where we discuss all latest topics related to health tech. Um, I'm, as always, your host. My name is Bardia. I'm the health practice lead uh, here in Switzerland, and I will also moderate the webcast. Our guest today is Blaise Jagolkowski. He is a principal consultant in our health practice. He's a seasoned expert in digital health solutions. And uh, I would like to very much welcome also you, Blaise, and look forward to the discussion that we are going to have together with our guests. Uh, you will share your, your insights about digital therapeutics, especially today, uh, when this is uh, one of the most discussed and sought after topics when it comes to you know, the digital pharma companies uh, and the like, especially the, you know, the digital units, also traditional pharmaceutical companies, of course. Um, when it comes to Zuke, just a couple of words. Zuke is an engineering company and a technology advisory. We have uh, a bit more than 1,300 people. And in the health practice, we are focused on solutions uh, for the medical devices, for the pharmaceutical and for, for the healthcare industries. Uh, which is a broad range. Uh, we try to um, go through most of them in the series of webcasts and share our knowledge and experience with you. And uh, today, um, uh, the presentation will last 35 to 40 minutes. It will be followed by a Q&A session. A couple of housekeeping uh, points. Uh, please be aware that there will be polls um, down the road in the presentation. And there is an option for you to vote on the screen. So please be ready to do so. If you have technical issues, write them, write them down in the questions uh, panel. You should see a panel um, probably at the top lower left or lower right part of your screen. That's the opportunity to also ask questions about or questions um, about the topic, raise them towards Blaze. I will uh, make sure that they will be asked. And if we don't make it at the end of the webcast, we will try uh, make the best out of it to answer them directly uh, by writing you email an email. Also, technical issues, write them down. There, we will uh, we will try to fix them. Um, then, um, be aware that this webinar or this webcast is being recorded. Uh, it is available on our website. So, if you miss it or a colleague has missed to join, um, there will be the link. It is available online and um, and for for the time. Uh, after this webcast is broadcasted. And then, again, like always, please feel free to get in touch with us and discuss your specific topics directly. The contact details of Blaise and myself will be in this webcast, so just feel free to write us an email, and we are very happy to help you with any further topics that raise. With these words, I would like to at the stage for you, Blaise. Please, uh, we very much look forward to, to your presentation and also to the discussion that we're going to have afterwards. Blaise, stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Bardia, and good morning to everyone. I'm very pleased today to talk to you about a topic I'm very passionate about, which is digital therapeutics. So I hope you, now, you are now all awake uh, and uh, we are ready to start. So I really believe that digital therapeutics are truly transforming the way care is delivered, risks are managed, and diseases are prevented. So I put here a title which maybe sounds slightly provocative, are apps going to replace drugs or pills? But actually I believe that uh, it's not too far away from the truth uh, that uh, in the near future uh, we'll have more and more alternative to chemical or biological drugs uh, in, the, in the realm of uh, digital applications. So I've been already introduced, I'm not going to do it again, but please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to continue the conversation afterwards. Well, let's kick in with a, with a question. Uh, I would like to understand a bit better uh, where do you work for or in. So especially if you work in the life science industry. So you should see now in a few seconds, or if not already now, a poll displayed on your screen. And you have a few options here. 
So I'll let you vote for the relevance of these options. And in a few seconds, uh, we're going to share with you the, the results of this poll. So just maybe a few more seconds. It would be interesting to see if you come from a pharma or medtech or health tech industry. Okay, so let's close the poll now and see the result. Okay, so I see that uh, most of you don't work in the life science industry, but quite a few work for the pharma industry or the health tech industry. Okay. So thank you for that. Let's move on to the next slide. So just a quick disclaimer first, uh, also that I wanted to say that all the views expressed in these documents are mine and do not reflect the views of uh, Zulke or any other company. So we'll start with the first definition of what are digital therapeutics, as there's still a lot of confusion around this uh, terminology. Uh, then we'll move on with uh, industry categorization. Uh, then we look also at the uh, reimbursement of uh, digital therapeutics as of today. Uh, we'll also look at the market landscape. And then later on, we'll deep dive into three concrete examples of digital therapeutics. And we'll conclude by uh, discussing the opportunities and challenges ahead. So definition first. Uh, you've all heard probably about this term digital therapeutics. Maybe you haven't heard of the term DGCerticals, which is much less used to describe the same thing. So they form an independent category of evidence-based products within the broader digital landscape, digital health landscape. And also they are software-generated therapeutic interventions. So most digital therapeutics just require a smartphone. A few of them require just a computer. Then access is done through a web portal and some require both. So, also, some DTICs are connected with, uh, with uh, or paired with hardware components such as wearables, biometric sensors, and diagnostic products. Then, DTICs really benefit from agile method methodologies developed a long time ago for software products and of a user centric approach, which is also in the DNA of app de developers. So, they usually, and mo most, uh, most of them, are very much patient centered. Uh, in their at their heart, and this uh, this focus of digital therapeutics really enabled them to more seamlessly blend uh, into clinical guidelines and care delivery systems, and also uh, put the patient lives uh, in the privacy of of their own environment. Then you have uh, what you call standalone uh, digital therapeutics versus around the pill digital therapeutics, uh, which means that some digital therapeutics just work by themselves whereas some digital therapeutics work in combination uh, with a drug and it can work with a specific drug or it can work with uh, any kind of drugs within a therapeutic class of drugs. And in that case, we call them drug agnostic. All right, so let's move on to a second poll. Uh, I would like to know now, how much do you know about digital therapeutics? It would be interesting to see if you have already expertise or not on this topic. So please, uh, answer to one of these options that you should see in front of you right now and then we'll check the results all together okay a few more seconds and we'll see how much experience experience or expertise you have on this topic okay so voting closed and I can see that well, there's a mix of a bit of everything. So we have here people who don't know anything about it and people who are experts also. I see uh, one out of four attendees are experts. All right, so I'll try to be up to the standard. <laughs> okay, so the next slide. So we're gonna now discuss a bit the in digital health industry categorization overall. So this is a slide which was provided by the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, which is a non-profit association, uh, which purpose is to uh, move the agenda of digital therapeutics, uh, influence policy uh, making, and uh, uh, establish a framework for this uh, new type of, of uh, products. Uh, so I invite you to go on also on the website. There's a lot of interesting material there. 
So as you can see uh, here on this picture, uh, digital therapeutics is a subset of digital medicines products, which is itself a subset of digital health broader category. So digital therapeutics are characterized, as, as I mentioned before, by clinical evidence plus real-world outcomes, whereas digital medicine also has clinical evidence but not real-world outcomes. And it's really the purpose and the function of a digital health product which determines its categorization, the risk level and requirements for the level of clinical evidence and regulatory oversight. And I really believe that end users, uh, clinicians and payers alike should understand the fundamental distinction between these categories as they have major differences with regards to safety, effectiveness and value. So if you look at the pyramids of, uh, of digital health products, so let's, let's call them health and wellness apps at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, you can see if you go on any store, Apple store of, of the likes, that there are thousands, actually more than half a million of these kind of apps on different app stores. And they represent more, much more than 99% of the total. So actually, digital medicines and digital therapeutics are much less than 1% of the total number of apps. And hence, that's why also it's so important to distinguish, to, to distinguish uh, what may, may make them unique. And uh, in 2018, uh, IQVIA uh, um, was estimating that there are about 200 new health apps added each day on different app stores. So the amount is, is uh, staggering, but in terms of DTX, uh, it's another story. Now, if we look at uh, the different types of products within each categories within digital health. So here I put some product examples. Uh, so you can see that digital health products are typically user-facing technologies, such as the lifestyle apps or fitness trackers, nutrition apps that we all have on our phones, or most of us. Uh, it could be also health information technology, such as electronic medical record systems, uh, which are mainly used in hospitals, or it could be also personal health records, as you all have heard about it. Then if we talk about digital medicine, uh, it's often about measurement products. So it could be digital diagnostics, so uh, these softwares which are detecting or confirming the presen presence of a disease or a condition uh, of interest or to identify individuals with a subtype of a disease. It could be also digital biomarkers, we're talking a lot about that. These are basically the tools which measures different patient characteristics, uh, typically through wearables or through directly through your smartphone, and they uh, inform you about uh, uh, biological uh, processes uh, or response to a therapeutic uh, intervention. And then you are also having this category, what you call electronic clinical outcome assessment systems, also electronic patient reported outcome systems, uh, which measure how patients feel, function or survive. Now digital therapeutics uh, has three subcategories itself. So it's either products which treat the disease, or which manage a disease or improve a health function, health function. And we're gonna go a bit deeper into these three set, uh, subcategories in a minute. But as you can see, they really deliver a therapeutic intervention, whereas the others don't. Just wanted also to bring here a few further clarifications about uh, digital therapeutics. So in, in practice, uh, digital medicines and digital therape uh, th therapeutics, sorry, are terms used interchangeably in the sense that they offer often confused, so you might see one used instead of the other, although they are obviously differences as I outlined today. Uh, while there may, may be borderline cases, overall digital therapeutics clearly qualify as medical device software. Accordingly, uh, digital therapeutics manufacturers are rightly obliged to actively manage patient safety along uh, the entire product life cycle which makes a quality management system, QMS, a prerequisite. And in, in, the, in the EU, the arrival of MDR, which was postponed by, one, by a year to May 2021 because of mainly COVID-19, changes the classification of medical device software. Almost any software that is class one under today's regulation will be class 2A or higher under MDR. Today, uh, there are quite some companies operating class one medical devices, most of them not being ISO 13485 certified. 
Uh, and this certification is effectively re required for getting a device to market under MDR and offers security by design to the users. Then I wanted just to also say that not all software as a medical devices are digital therapeutics if they don't have the required evidence. Then not all digital therapeutics are reimbursed and we're going to come back to that also a bit later and there are various business models actually to monetize digital therapeutics. And then not all digital therapeutics are also on prescriptions, although many of them are. Okay, so now if we look at the three subcategories that I mentioned earlier in digital therapeutics, managing or preventing a medical disorder, optimizing medication and treating a medical disease or disorder. We're going to look at uh, some, some differences between these three subcategories. With regards to claims uh, of risk and efficacy and also intended use, in any case, you need third-party validation by a regulatory or equivalent national body. Now, if you look at the uh, severity uh, or the, the intensity of the claims, uh, you go from low to medium, medium risk claims when it's about managing or preventing a medical disorder to medium to high risk claims when it's about optimizing a medication or even treating a disease itself. With regards to patient access to the products, um, in the first two categories, it could be either over the counter or a prescription might be required. But when it comes to treating a medical disease or disorder, a prescription is always required. And then if you look at the relationship to concurrent therapies, uh, in the first category, it could be either monotherapy or directly supporting a concurrent treatment. Obviously, if it's about optimizing medication, you need to have another treatment uh, to go with it. And it, if it's about treating a medical disease, it can be both monotherapy or direct support. So as you can see, if it's about treating a, a disease, uh, it very much looks like uh, the same criteria as, as for a pill. Here I wanted also to share with you this uh, re research which was conducted by McKinsey and was published uh, last year, which is looking at uh, the research which was published uh, about digital therapeutics, so scientific articles. And as you can see here, and sorry it's written maybe a bit small on your screen, that uh, although there's a very high number of articles published on the topic, uh, as of 2018, so this was already two, three years ago, uh, very few are peer-reviewed publications with data. Actually, only 1.8% were peer-reviewed and even less with data. Uh, and as of 2019, we had 300 randomized clinical trials conducted around digital therapeutics. So now uh, the, the quality, I would say, of scientific publication is increasing, but until recently, there was few quality uh, articles, scientific uh, articles, which were backing the, the claims of these products, hence which was not providing enough uh, um, guarantees to, to especially to doctors that these products were working the way they were supposed to. Now let's look quickly at the reimbursement landscape. So, well, you all know that Germany is leading the way in Europe with what we call the DIGA, the Digital Health Applications. And the coming into force of uh, Digital Healthcare Act uh, in Germany late 2019 marked really the, the introduction into the healthcare system of what we call the app of prescri prescription uh, for patients. Uh, this means that actually approximately 73 million people uh, covered by the German statutory health insurance are entitled to use a DIGA prescribed by a physician or a psychotherapist and are reimbursed by health insurances. So as of early March, 11 uh, DIGAs are reimbursed within the public health system, and we forecast that there would be more than 100 by 2025. Then in France, uh, you have only one uh, digital therapy which is fully reimbursed, uh, like, a, like a pill, if you want, uh, by the Sécurité Sociale. Two of us actually reimbursed for a special program. And uh, France was actually a pioneer in digital therapeutics because they had the first product uh, from a company called Volantis, uh, in 2011, so already 10 years ago, uh, uh, released on the market. However, at that time, the, the market was not ripe for, for, for this kind of innovation. Uh, and in, in the meantime, unfortunately, the bureaucracy has slowed down the penetration of this kind of, of uh, solutions. Um, but I, I think there are many more which are going to be launched very soon. 
In the UK, uh, I'm not so much a specialist of that market, but I know that a few digital therapeutics are regionally or nationally reimbursed, provided that they fulfill an evidence standard framework published by NHS that I'm going to talk also about in a minute. And it's a, you have then in this case to provide evidence for both effectiveness and for economic impact, quite similarly to uh, the German system. Then in Switzerland, there isn't any digital therapeutics reimbursed on a national level, but some of them are reimbursed by specific insurance companies on a case-by-case -case basis. In Japan, only one digital therapeutics is reimbursed by the public health authorities. Uh, it's a smoking cessation uh, drug. If we look at the price of a DGAS, so this is an extraction of an official bee farm website. Uh, where everything is very transparent. Uh, so you can see the names of the 11 DIGAs here, and it's ranked from the most expensive to the least expensive. Uh, so you can see that the most expensive is priced at 743 euros for a course of three months therapy, uh, whereas the cheapest one is uh, slightly above 100 euros. <clears throat> and all of them have a therapy duration of around three months, which could be extended in some cases. As you can see also in terms of indications, uh, we have a quite a variety of different uh, therapeutic areas which are covered here, but you see a, a majority of uh, CNS, so central nervous system uh, type of, of, uh, of products, uh, especially for depression, for example, or anxiety, uh, because DTX are very well suited for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. Then I wanted to share with you, uh, and you can find it on the NHS website, uh, the, the evidence standard framework for digital health technologies that they published. For, with regards to digital therapeutics, uh, they fall into the evidence tier 3B, uh, where you have to provide a quite high level of evidence before uh, get, getting access to, to the reimbursement uh, within the NHS system. Okay, I just hope you're still all with me now. We're going to talk about the USA. Uh, so, in the US, you have eight FDA clear, cleared PDT, so this is how they call it there, the prescription digital therapeutics. Uh, so, you see that it's dominated by a company called Pair Therapeutics, which was also a pioneer in the US in the field of digital therapeutics. They have today three products uh, which have gained clearance from FDA, either through 510K or de novo status. Then you have a French company, Volontis, also, which launched on the US market two products, uh, one for diabetes type 2, one for cancer uh, symptom management. The other one is Achille Interactive, and I'm going to talk to you more about this one also in a few minutes. Then you have WellDoc uh, in the field of diabetes type 1 and 2, uh, which is on prescription only if it's combined with an insulin titration system. And then another company called Amalgam has a product as well called Isage Erix on the market for diabetes type 2. Okay, so now let's move on to our next poll. So have you ever used a DTX product? So as usual, you'll see now a few options opening on your screen. And I'll leave you, I'll give you a few more minutes, uh, sorry, seconds <laughs> to answer to the question and we look at the results together. So just a few more seconds, and we'll see if you have already experience with this kind of product or not. Okay. So the results should come now. Votings are closed. Okay. So I can see that some of you have used a DTX product, that's great. I guess these are the ones who are called the experts. Um, and then some of them, the majority actually uh, use uh, at least some, uh, some kind of uh, wellness apps. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So the DTX landscape. So this is a slide from uh, Business Insider published last year. Uh, you can see that uh, they, they uh, expect the market to grow 21% annually and hit $9 billion by 2025. Uh, especially digital adoption, consumer adoption of digital treatments will grow very significantly in the next coming years. And there's a clear acceleration uh, because of COVID-19. And if you look at the cost of chronic diseases in the US alone, 
in 2018, that was a staggering number of $3.3 trillion, which was spent on chronic diseases, which is very significant. And digital therapeutics have a very high potential to address and to tackle this, this uh, growing issue of chronic diseases related especially to lifestyle. If um, we deep, dig, deep, deep digger into the market size, uh, this is some research I've done and I, I found a report from uh, Roland Berger in particular, um, who says that all in all innovation in digital therapeutics adds up to great news for patients because um, also, um, also for pharmaceutical companies, actually, that's great news too, because they have calculated that through digital therapeutics already today, 5% of the value of a global pharma market could be addressable in theory. Uh, so this represents roughly 60 billion US dollars uh, in 2019 as a total addressable market. So we're really seeing here uh, the birth of a digital pharmaceutical industry. And according to the most, uh, let's say, optimistic uh, forecasts, uh, the market should even reach um, almost 10 billion by 2025 and 14 billion by 2027. If we look at now the market growth in different regions, uh, currently US is, is clear, clearly leading in terms of uh, market penetration of such uh, solutions. <clears throat> but Europe is very quickly catching up, especially thanks to, to the, to the DIGAS in Germany. And Asia actually represents the greatest potential uh, for innovation and faster adoption that has uh, low penetration as of today. Now let's look at these areas of applications and, and trends related to that. As you can see uh, today, um, the leading indications are in the field of diabetes, obesity, but also ophthalmology. There's quite a few uh, DTX coming up. Cancer, pain management, and CNS disorders, especially with the use of computer games and con cognitive behavioral therapy. In, in the near future, you'll see DTX act actually across all types of therapeutics areas. Uh, still tackling chronic conditions in the field of respiratory, musculoskeletal, digestive system, chronic heart failure, and uh, you name it. All right, so I hope now you're excited to look at three concrete examples of digital therapeutics. My first example is uh, from France. Uh, it's a DTX called MoveCare by a company called Sivan. Uh, so CVAN has developed uh, a web-based or app-based questionnaire so as uh, the patients with lung cancer can uh, provide uh, insights about their condition uh, on, on a weekly basis, mainly reporting their symptoms. And this allows them to detect uh, early uh, the potential relapses or complications during the follow-up. Uh, so it means when the, the, the cancer patients uh, take the therapy, uh, they only see the doctor once per month, or uh, even less in some cases. With that kind of solution, uh, they, they are kind of, uh, they feel empowered first, and they kind of have a possibility to inform much more quickly the care teams if there's any um, deterioration of their condition. So how does it work? You can see that on, on the website. Uh, so first, the product is prescribed to the patient. Then patients will report their symptoms weekly, as I said, uh, through the app. Then an algorithm analyzes the symptoms and detects any anomaly. And if any anomaly is detected, then an alert is sent to the medical team for further investi investigation uh, via SMS and via email. Uh, and then the doctor or the nurse can take immediate action and the patient, if, for example, can uh, immediately seek assistance and go to the hospital if something goes wrong. And this allows, this early detection really allows to uh, significantly improve uh, not only the quality of life of a patient, but also the overall survival. So this company, uh, MoveCare, was founded in 2014, but the first idea already emerged in 2011, so already 10 years ago. So it, you can see that it took a long time to have this product put on the market. And uh, it was a long journey for them. Uh, they started uh, applying for reimbursement, uh, maybe discussing pricing with the French authorities in 2018, and they just got it in 2020. Uh, but now they fully reimbursed like a drug. They have uh, very solid evidence uh, because they conducted a two-year randomized clinical trial, 
And the outcome of his trial was that the median overall survival was 22.5 months versus 14.9 months for the standard of care. So you see here an exceptional increase of 7.6 months of overall survival, which is more than actually many biological drugs, for example, just to give you an idea, some biological drugs extend your overall survival on average of four to five months or even less. So this is, was a very significant uh, outcome that they obtained. Also, with regards to an indicator we call quality, the quality adjusted life years, which is more like a, a economic um, health economic uh, parameter. We can we can see here that they have a, a gain of 4.6 years, which again is extremely significant. So just to also give you a definition of quality, this is a generic measure of uh, disease burden, including both the quality and the quantity of life lived. With regards to pricing, uh, they managed to agree with the French authorities on a price of 500 euros per quarter. And as the prescription usually lasts for six months, it's about 1,000 euros to compare with the price of uh, drugs treating uh, cancer, which are more than 10,000 or even $100,000 per year per patient in some cases. So it's not very substantial compared to the price of, of, a, of a treatment itself, but it really adds a lot of value. Then my second example comes from the US. I already mentioned this uh, company called Achille, which got uh, status of uh, prescription digital therapeutics and was cleared by the FDA. So you can see in, on this screen uh, a video game. So in this video game, the aim is to successfully navigate your character through a course while collecting targets and avoiding bumping into obstacles. And actually, this requires a lot of uh, skills in order to, to, uh, to play uh, this game. And this game was speci specifically designed to trigger the activation of certain parts of your brain, uh, which uh, are related to your attention. And this product is actually called Endeavor Arix, developed by Achille, as I said. Uh, they announced uh, in 2020, uh, the clearance by the FDA, as I said, uh, of their product for children with ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And this is very unique because it's the first prescription treatment delivered through a video game. So although it looks like a, a regular video game, there's a lot of science and research behind the scene to come up, come up with the right video game. They got clearance based on data from five clinical studies in more than 600 children diagnosed with ADHD, including a prospective randomized control study. So that here again, uh, you can see that the clinical evidence which is required is extremely substantial in order to get uh, this statue as, as a pill. The company was founded in 2011, so also there it took them 10 years to put this product on the market. And interestingly, they're supported by Shire, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company who is today the market leader in ADHD medication. So Shire doesn't see them as, as a competitor, but more as a, as, a, as a kind of partner to address these, this condition. With regards to the price, uh, we're talking here about $450 for a three months period, which is actually in this case the average treatment period. Looking at the data obtained, uh, I just wanted to show here the result of a controlled clinical trial uh, where they demonstrated a significant improvement in a computer-based measure of potential called, called uh, TOVA uh, compared to digital control uh, word game. So I think the picture speaks for itself. Uh, also, I can add here that uh, in, in the controlled clinical study, 48 of patients, uh, oh, sorry, 48% of parents indicated that Endeavor Rx improved ADHD-related day-to-day impairment after only one month of this treatment. And 56% of parents indicated the treatment improved their, their child's attention after one or two months. So here it raises the question, would you, like, would you prefer giving uh, the appeal to, to uh, treat ADHD to your children, or do you prefer giving them a, vi a video game? Well, in, 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 uh, in the present case, the video game uh, is prescribed often along the pill, but actually they, they have found out that if you have the video game without the pill, uh, you obtain more or less the same results, actually, with regards to uh, efficacy. And uh, there were no serious advance uh, 
seen in any clinical trial. So that's also an advantage also of um, using a video game instead of using a pill. Uh, of uh, 538, for example, participants using this product, 50 uh, participant experienced some kind of uh, very mild uh, treatment related adverse events, but nothing compared to, uh, to, uh, to, to pills. Now let's talk about a third example, uh, which was developed initially in Germany, but it's actually mainly used in the US. Uh, it's a company called Kaya Health, which has developed a product for tr the treatment of lower back pain. So in this picture, you can see that uh, this man is doing some exercise uh, on his mats under the supervision of a virtual coach on his tablet. So, you can see that uh, this is a print screen from, from, from the app, uh, that they have a, a custom programs created, created based on condition, progress, and feedback. So it's really customized to individuals. Uh, the uh, cutting edge artificial intelligence to monitor, quantify, and analyze human movement. And on top of it, you also have access to, to real coaches, uh, accredited coaches who support patients also every step of the way. So in this case, they have developed um, a solution which is actually not innovative in the sense that it's completely new, but it's the sense that they, they completely digitalized an existing therapy uh, and added some extra intelligence to it through AI. So this company was created in 2026, uh, sorry, 2016, <laughs> and clo they closed a quite significant series A around last year. Uh, they, as I said, uh, have a program for digital musculoskeletal, uh, and it's, it's mainly uh, indicated for lower back pain. The app is available to users whose employers cover it as a benefit, but you can also uh, download it yourself, but then you have to pay out of pocket. So this, this is not a prescription product. Um, Kaya Health has chosen a different uh, route for monetization and a different mo business model, but this business model is, is very successful. And uh, they have uh, also here a lot of clinical evidence. They have, a, in particular, a randomized controlled trial with 1,245 patients with very good uh, results. And in terms of number of users, uh, it's probably the most successful digital therapeutics available today, uh, as they have 400,000 people uh, using it. And this number was uh, from two months ago, so probably that it has already increased significantly since then. With regards to costs or price, uh, it's about $250 per month uh, if you want to take it as a self-pay plan. Uh, but it's, as I said, many pay paid in the US through company benefits, which is a very popular um, way of monetizing uh, such solutions in the US. All right, so now next question. I hope you're still with me. Uh, would you be willing to use a digital therapeutics? So please, answer to the question by selecting one of the options you can see right now on your screen. And I'll give you a few more seconds and we'll check the results together. Okay, so let's see if you are interested or willing to use such a product. We should see the results very soon. Okay, so no one believe, doesn't believe that it really works. That's great. Uh, I hope I contributed to convince you that uh, <laughs> they have enough clinical evidence to support the claims. So, but many of you say uh, maybe on a case by case basis. Uh, but even more, I think, actually, uh, that they are willing to use it uh, for treating a chronic disease. All right, fantastic. So let's move on to the next slide. I just wanted to mention here that uh, it's not, it doesn't look all so, so rosy, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, market uh, uh, landscape, as uh, the, the road for, to commercial success uh, is quite bumpy, as, as, uh, as usual with, with innovative products. And in this case, uh, I took an extract from a press release, uh, which was from late 2019, where Sandoz, so Novartis, said no to pair therapeutics uh, digital apps. 
uh, indeed they had a, a big partnership in place uh, until then and uh, they wanted to commercialize or Novartis was supposed to commercialize on behalf of Pair Therapeutics their solution but eventually they decided to, um, to uh, part the ways in this case for, for different reasons apparently more, mostly related to Novartis internal strategy but this was, this was still a kind of a blow for, for Pair Therapeutics uh, and they, um, they today commercializing their products by themselves uh, and they had to raise a bit more money in order to do that, but they, they're still on track. And the good news is that more recently, uh, big deals have been signed, uh, especially a company called Click Therapeutics has been under the spotlight uh, recently. They managed to, to land a, a very, very substantial uh, deal with Boringer Ingelheim, up to 500 millions. So this is not a money that they will pocket immediately, but it's uh, money which is related to, to our achievement of uh, several milestones and related to the success of a drug uh, they're going to develop together uh, for the treatment in this case of schizophrenia. But Click Therapeutics also signed a, a similar agreement with Otsuka Pharmaceuticals uh, last year for 300 million. So I would say that they are really uh, on track to become the biggest digital therapeutics around. We have actually a whole pipeline of products uh, <clears throat> like, a, like a biotech company has. What's the impact on the value chain of digital therapeutics? So you have impact at all levels. On pharmacies, first, uh, you can imagine that they're not used to sell digital products, so they have to innovate now through online sales. Then insurance uh, are very interested in, in, in this type of solutions because they allow to mitigate uh, spending and generate as well new revenue streams as well as uh, uh, they enable the implementation of uh, pay-for-performance schemes. Pharma and medtech uh, companies are also uh, building more and more partnerships uh, with DTX vendors to dip into new revenue streams and also add value to the current drugs. As I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of these DTX work in combination with existing drugs. And then healthcare practitioners also, uh, probably this is where we still have uh, one of the biggest bottleneck because they have to learn how to prescribe this kind of uh, new products and how to get reimbursed also for the time they spent on it. So uh, in this case, uh, there's in some healthcare system not adequate codes required uh, to get them paid for learning about these products and, and managing uh, these type of, uh, of new approaches. Then there are many opportunities ahead still uh, because there's a really an increased usage of digital mar mar biomarkers for clinical trials and Pfizer is for example collaborating with uh, Achille uh, in this respect. Then also uh, digital therapeutics is, is uh, very much related to precision medicine as you have heard also about this term I suppose. Uh, they are, precision medicine is defined by the four P's participatory, preventative, predictive and personalized and DTX uh, really help to enable uh, the, the advent of precision medicine. Uh, the prediction part come, would come if there is an AI component into the DTX. Then patient adherence uh, also can be increased through DTX because they, they stage a new level of what we call patient activation and engagement. And uh, they, as DTX uh, are very patient centric by design, uh, they, they, um, they really help with uh, tackling uh, ad adherence, which is still a major issue for pharma companies with regards to achieving the desired outcomes and optimizing the, the pharma sales. It is estimated actually that in some therapeutic areas, up to 50% of patients do not adhere to the treatments. With DTX, you can really measure and quantify the progress by the users. Uh, and therefore, you can really um, uh, capture um, and, and, and entice uh, patients uh, to, to uh, continue uh, sticking to, to their treat, treatment. Then there are a few challenges also ahead and we're almost done with the presentation. So I think one of the major issue is still the, the ability for the general uh, public uh, audience to uh, understand what's the difference between uh, health and well-being applications and uh, digital therapeutics. And also in, in the in the healthcare industry and doctors are all often not uh, yet well informed about it. Then there are also, as I said, an, in, even incentives in the healthcare environment. 
uh, and uh, there's really a need to implement these new reimbursement codes I was referring to earlier. Uh, acceptance has really increased during COVID-19, but the adoption, especially by doctors, is still lagging. And last but not least, if you look at the development costs, costs of, a, of a digital therapeutics compared to a wellness product, it's very much more significant. So I think some probably some entrepreneurs didn't realize that it would cost more than 10 times or in this sometimes 50 times more to develop a digital therapeutic uh, as you need to set up clinical trials uh, and, and you need uh, different sites, you need uh, to have enough patients enrolled and you need to, to handle all the regulatory part. This costs a lot of money and therefore you need to have quite significant uh, investment in order to come up with the mark on the market with such a product. Okay, last poll and almost last slide. Uh, do you think that the healthcare industry should switch to an outcome-based model instead of being volume-based? So we say outcome-based, uh, which is quite similar to uh, value-based. And I would like to know if you think that or if you even understand the question. So as I can tailor my pitch on my next slide according to your answer. So I guess you have all you all have time to vote. And let's see the results now. It should come by now. Okay, so well, you all agree that the volume-based current model is not uh, the most suitable. That's great to see because I totally agree with you. And just a few people do not understand the question. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So what's the link with value-based healthcare? And, and after that, we, we go to the conclusion. So you really have, uh, in the case of digital therapeutics, and I think it's, it's very important, but still heavily uh, underreported, uh, that uh, the value of this digital therapeutics is a native integration into value-based healthcare uh, models and processes. Uh, and I think DT should definitely become the intervention of, cho of choice to drive new VBC value-based healthcare pilots in classic healthcare systems. Also, most of uh, DTX solutions have been initially designed to work in a pay-per-service setting, but they, they could quite easily shift to bundle payment system as it wouldn't require so much more additional engineering work by solution providers. I think what is really lacking is still a proper uh, a regulatory framework and it's more the job of policy makers to make it happen in this case. Uh, then last but not least patient reported outcomes measures and also patient activation measures are really an integral part of most digital solutions. Uh, indeed the embedded uh, patient reported outcomes within the digital therapy data flow can really feed these, these loops in real time and really as I said before enable this individualization of uh, the therapy and also of uh, the related reimbursement. All right, so the conclusions are the following. So as you have all understood, uh, digital therapies are shaking up the healthcare value chain and the market is about to triple in the next five years in terms of size. Then I think payers, and I think we're already doing that in many countries, they should stock portfolio with more uh, digital therapies to, to uh, decrease drug spending and curb a sizable share of chronic diseases costs and as well keep patients healthy, of course, uh, and in the US attracting new employer contracts. Then the pharma and medical device manufacturers actually really benefit, I think, from, from digital therapeutics. Uh, and they could, they could do even more by establishing uh, what we call tie-ups or partnerships with vendors uh, as they would have access to uh, piles of real-time data, uh, with respect, of course, to data privacy and data security uh, regulations, and also new revenue oppor opportunities through commercializing these new products and programs, often around the pill. And last but not least, I really think also that a systemic changes, change is really required to enable the larger adoption of digital therapeutics by healthcare practitioners. All right, sorry, I've been a bit longer than I was expecting, but I hope you enjoy this, this talk. Uh, and now I'm very open to listen to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blaise, for your presentation and uh, the in-depth introduction into 
digital therapeutics. There are a couple of questions uh, which I would like to discuss with you. One of them is about uh, the value chain. Uh, you mentioned that the role of pharmacies when it came to digital therapeutics um, value chain. Do you really think that the pharmacies will be part of this or would it rather be that app stores or websites or other sales channels uh, would be the preferred ones in order to get your hand on digital therapeutics as a patient but also as a healthcare professional? Yeah, well, I'm not specialized into pharmacies, but what I can say is that uh, I, can, I can feel that pharmacies are a bit uh, left behind in, in, in this case because uh, obviously the brick and mortar pharmacies have little value uh, with regards to digital solutions. And uh, I haven't tried to order myself online and digital, on digital pharmacies uh, recently, so I haven't seen such, such solutions available. But in any case, uh, most of them are available on your prescription, so there's a specific process to follow. Uh, and um, there's, for example, a QR code to be scanned by the patient to have access on, on the store uh, to the app and, and be able to download it or to uh, they can download it but not activate it. Uh, so right now, I think pharmacies uh, don't have much um, uh, influence into, into the value chain. Okay, understood. Um, what about the company that you mentioned? Uh, is there any sign of uh, profitability? Uh, are, uh, the question thing, I think goes, is this all very early stage and investment cases, or do we already see that this big market that is uh, that we are approaching, like the sixty billion dollar market, that we already see profits coming out of such entrepreneurial endeavors? Well, as far as I know, there's a lot of investments, uh, and last year was a record year with regards to investment in digital health in general and digital therapeutics in particular. Uh, I haven't heard so much about profitability so far. Uh, I mean, there are big deals which are being signed, especially with pharma companies. Uh, these numbers look very impressive, but uh, they still need yet to materialize. So I, have, I didn't have access to the P&L uh, of, of, any, of any of these companies or, or financial statements. I would assume mm -hmm. that Kaya Health is profitable because they have such a high number of users today uh, so if you make an easy calculation of the number of users times the price uh, of their, their solution, even if they have volume discounts with the big employers in the U.S., I'm sure they, they, they're making some money. Uh, but uh, now it's still early days. Uh, we still at the beginning of the journey. There was a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles and complexity to set the right price, to have a process established. I mean, the DIGAs are very new in Germany. They just started last year. Uh, and unfortunately, the prescription level is still quite low. They, they are up to date, as to date, 4,000 prescriptions of DIGAs in Germany. So uh, it's not that much. Uh, and it's, this is overall across the 11 DIGAs. So it's uh, on average less than 400 prescriptions per DIGA. So I doubt mm -hmm. that uh, they, they are generating any profit at this stage. It's more of a long term which matters. Mm -hmm. And who do you think are, are those professionals prescribing digital therapeutics, at least those are on the market? Is it more the general practitioners or is it in secondary care and um, specialized, um, specialized doctors? Well, 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 do you see any tendency at the moment, at least looking at the portfolio of the digital therapeutics available already? Well, it really depends country by country. For example, in France, uh, move care is in the field of uh, lung cancer. Uh, and therefore, it's mainly uh, cancer, uh, well, oncologists uh, in many clinics. Actually, there are 25 clinics, I think, where move care is established in France. And these are, these are the specialists who prescribe it. Uh, in Germany, it's more the GPs, <clears throat> uh, because many of these uh, applications uh, are, uh, could be or are prescribed by, by, by general practitioners more than specialists, as, as, I, as far as I know today. And mm -hmm. in, in the US, I don't know, but I would think also that probably GPs or uh, probably also people specialized in, um, in neurological diseases, conditions uh, who would prescribe typically drugs for ADHD, uh, would prescribe, for example, and Ericks. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that the GPs might be a bit hesitant in doing so. There has been an initiative of, uh, it's also one of the questions, the initiative of the German GPs against the DIGA, um, the DIGA um, program. So I think also on that, uh, on that level, a lot of obstacles have to yet uh, be overcome. 
another question uh, which is here is regarding the clinical studies costs is there any comparison um, between you know the clinical studies necessary for approval of a digital therapeutics compared to a let's say standard biochemical therapeutics well, I think there are more similarities and differences. I mean, uh, the, the clinical trials should be uh, pharma grade, and therefore uh, you, you have the same kind of uh, setups, uh, especially we, we talk about randomized clinical trials. Um, well, you need to have multi sites, uh, you, you need to follow very specific protocols. Uh, of course, it's a different approach because you have to educate uh, either the doctors or the nurses how to use the, the digital uh, application. Uh, so they need to, to be uh, uh, trained and there needs to be some literacy about these new technologies. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I mean, we don't reach yet the numbers of uh, patients that you can see in some uh, pharmaceutical, traditional pharmaceutical trials. Uh, for example, in, in uh, heart diseases, you often have 5,000 patients in a phase three trial or 10,000 patients. Uh, whereas uh, currently in digital therapeutics, the biggest trials I've seen are maybe yeah, 600 patients. Uh, so we're not yet reaching the same numbers, but we're getting closer and closer. How come? Can you elaborate on that? I mean, we don't see digital therapeutics on the global scale yet, right? You mentioned those fragmentation, you mentioned Germany, the UK, France. Um, but how come we don't have multi-center digital uh, therapeutic clinical trials and rollouts? Yeah, because, I mean, uh, like in the traditional pharma market, uh, it, it, the markets are very fragmented with, when it comes to market access, so pricing and reimbursement. Every country has different schemes. Uh, uh, even in the EU, uh, there's a sovereignty uh, on these topics. So every national uh, system decides by, by itself uh, how, how to proceed. And uh, it's also about uh, maturity of the market to accept these kind of solutions. So, uh, although on a technical, technological standpoint, a priori, it's easy to scale software products on a more, uh, um, I would say, um, soft level, administrative level, political level, uh, policy level, uh, there's a lot of things which prevent uh, easy scale up. Uh, but uh, when there will be more uh, clearly established guidelines and frameworks, uh, especially in the US and in Europe, we'll see larger adoption. Excellent. Well, thank you very much also to all our guests for, for writing down and sharing with us their questions. There are many more questions um, we, will, uh, we will answer via email. We have your, uh, your contact details. Um, as mentioned, the, this webcast is being recorded and will be available on our website as well. And with these closing remarks, um, uh, thank you again, Blaise, and all the guests, and I wish you a very good day ahead. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you very much to everyone and have a nice day. Bye-bye.